everybody to the second episode in my top 50 board game series. Now you might notice that my surroundings right now look a little different from what you saw in the last episode and it's different from what you're going to see in the rest of this episode because the original segment I recorded for this video was lost to the ether somehow. So that's a real shame because I promise, boy, that intro segment was funny and witty and insightful. So uh, you're just gonna have to take my word on that one. But I figured I'd better record, you know, some kind of intro segment so we didn't just awkwardly jump into my number 40 game, right? Am I am I making it more awkward? I'm I'm making it more awkward, aren't I? Uh, sorry about that, everybody. You know what? Let's just awkwardly jump into my number 40 board game. And my number 40 game is Thunder Alley. This is a phenomenal racing game that has a lot going on, but not too much. And I really enjoy it. I like the fact that you are managing a whole team of cars that you can have work together and that you can use cleverly. And hey, you know, I like the fact that if you don't win the race, you can still win the game if you manage your team smartly. The card play is clever and it makes a lot of sense and it allows you to be both strategic and reactive. But of course, the heart of Thunder Alley is in the drafting mechanism. So managing your cars so that they hook up to the pack and get pulled around the track with them is one of my favorite elements. It's super clever and it feels so thematic, at least to somebody who doesn't know anything about NASCAR. Thunder Alley is a great racing game experience. It plays a large player count. It gets totally chaotic, which is totally awesome. And it is my number 40 game. Coming in at number 39 is Longhorn, which is a fabulous two-player only game that features beautiful Western-themed art from Vincent Dutre, and it's a game all about cattle rustling that leverages a similar mechanism as Five Tribes. Basically, players are going to pick up all the cows of a single color on a space and then move this player piece that number of spaces away. So if you pick up two orange cows, you're going to move the player piece two spots away. And wherever it lands, that is the space that the opponent will get to select cows from. You keep on doing this, collecting different cows and building up your own personal herd in front of you. But at the end of the game, cows will score points based on the number of that color left on the board. So if you have five orange cows and there are two left on the board, you've got 10 points. But if you have 10 orange cows and there are none left on the board, you've got zilch. And that is so compelling. You are looking at the board, trying to plot out how many cows you want to take, which color, how far that'll move your piece, where that'll put your opponent, what they're going to pick. It's pretty thinky when you think about it. But it's also very simple and fairly quick to play. It is a small box game that is inexpensive because it's produced by Blue Orange, which also means it's a really high quality production. It's one of my favorite two player games and one of my favorite games of all time. That is Longhorn. My number 38 game is Imperial Settlers. There are so many things going on in this game that I love individually. Throw them all together and it's just a fabulous game experience. I mean, the asymmetric factions alone provide hours and hours of gameplay exploration because each one plays out totally differently. And then you have the multi-use cards as you try to decide if you want to use them to make deals for resources or whether you want to add them to your tableau. And then you have the tableau management, uh, whether you, as you're trying to like decide if you want to raise buildings or keep them because you need them longer, whether you want to draw from the general deck or your faction deck, and then there's the resource management, and all that is put together in an attractive and well-produced package. Imperial Settlers is an absolute winner. I'm going to get every expansion that comes out for it. It's never going to leave my collection, and it is my number 38 game. Coming in at number 37 is Steamrollers. This is a dice-based train game that offers a lot of the satisfaction of a big board train game, but in like a 16th of the time. 
There's an element of dice drafting in this one because when the dice are ruled, one die will determine the region that you can impact and then the other dice that you draft from will determine what shape of track you get to use. And each player will get your own player board, which is essentially a piece of paper, and you're going to be literally drawing the tracks on it, connecting different colored regions and different cities so that you can pick up and deliver different colored cubes accordingly for points. There's also things you can do like upgrading your engine so that you can travel farther distances and there are special ability cards that you can draft from as well so that you can kind of change up the gameplay. Steamrollers works so well on so many levels and it is a bonus that it even has a wonderful solo play experience as well that I play a lot on my own. Steamrollers is a little bit harder to get, but I have word that as of today, which is late 2016, in 2017, there's going to be a Kickstarter launching a new edition of this wonderful game. I definitely recommend you check it out. That's Steamrollers, my number 37 game of all time. The classic dice game Las Vegas is my number 36 game. And really, there's not a lot I can say about this one. It's such a simple game, really. But for some reason, it just works so well. And I consider it almost the perfect filler. The dice are so much fun just to roll. And, you know, I always end up yelling a lot during this game for some reason. But even though they're heavily dice-based, there are still smart choices that you have to make on where and when you use those dice. So there's also that element to it. Las Vegas is easy to teach. It's quick to play. It's super accessible. And it is a wonderful filler that I could bring almost anywhere and have a great time with. So it is my number 36 game. My pick for number 35 is Onitama. This is a beautiful two-player abstract game that has a surprising amount of depth for how simple the mechanisms are. I really like the way that the cards flow between players because you have five cards that determine the movement for the pawns for the entire game for both players. And I really like the fact that you can see what your opponent has available to them. So you can predict what are their options? Where could they go? Where will you land? How can you set yourself up for a turn or two or three in the future? Yeah, it's a little bit chess-like, but probably simpler uh, and definitely more random right? Because while you play with only five cards each game, there's a ton of cards in that box. So every game will be different. Now, some people have said that some of the cards are way overpowered. And some people will complain that different games will be really weird because you'll get a set of cards that don't allow for certain kinds of movement. And none of that worries me at all. I mean, if I get walloped by one overpowered card, well, the game will be over quickly and we can move on to a new set. And if you get a set of cards that doesn't allow certain types of movement, making it more difficult, well, then you have a new gameplay challenge to deal with. Onitama is an excellent two-player game experience. The production is gorgeous on this one. I really should paint those minis. Too bad I don't paint anything. Um, but it is a keeper. It is one of my favorites, and it is my number 35. My pick for number 34 is Among the Stars, which is a tile lane and drafting game. I really like how the drafting complements the tile lane as you're building up these individual space stations because the space station element is very puzzly in making sure that you're placing rooms so that they're powered up and they're comboing off of each other. But the draft adds that interesting planning and random element as you're thinking ahead to what you think you'll get back to what your opponents need and you have to be flexible when you don't get the cards that you want. Among the Stars is a bit of a table hog and the original score track wasn't great, but they've done a wonderful job supporting it with expansions and it remains one of my favorite drafting games to this day, so it is my number 34 game. The first time I played Junk Art, I fell in love with it and that's one of the reasons it is my number 33 game. Junk Art is a dexterity game that is full of beautiful wooden bits and all different colors and shapes and sizes that you have to stack up on each other. But what sets Junk Art apart is that there is an actual game in this dexterity game, which, let's face it, not all of them can claim. 
basically you're going to get different city cards and each one of them dictates a different way that you're going to use these pieces. So maybe you're in a city that says, hey, build a common structure, but you're going to force your opponent to put pieces on it. Or maybe you're building up your own structure and you're trying to build it to the tallest height you can. Or maybe you're trying to build it so that pieces that match color or shape are touching each other. There's just a lot of variety in between these different cities. And when you mix and match them for a single game, there is huge variability between games. Junk art is a simple game at its heart, but the variability is what really sets it apart. Along with what a stunning game it is on the table, it is so engaging, it is full of tension, it has player interaction, and you're just sitting there sometimes in awe of what you've done or what your opponents have done that creates some really magical moments around the table. So Junk Art is a phenomenal, unique dexterity game, and it is my number 33. Without a doubt, my game tastes stray to the Euro side of the hobby, but that doesn't mean I can't enjoy an Amerithrash game once in a while, but it's got to be a good one. And Arcadia Quest is a great one. There are a lot of things about Arcadia Quest that I like. I like the chibi style minis. I think they're cute. And I really like the PvP element to the game because there's nothing more satisfying to me than teaming up with somebody to kill a big bad and then turning around and shooting them in the back when they're not looking and then listening to them yell at me. That's, that's normal, right? Arcadia Quest has a ton of different gameplay challenges and scenarios, and I really like that there are so many different playable characters so that you can really just explore each one and figure out which one clicks with your play style, which one you have the most fun with, and how they work well as a team. Arcadia Quest obviously has a phenomenal production value from Cool Mini or Not, and it is an Amerithrash game that's in my collection and that I enjoy, so it is my number 32. And my number 31 pick is Castellian, which is part of the Oniverse series of games. And maybe I'm cheating a little bit, but I do want to say I love this entire series of solitaire games. But Castellian is my favorite, probably because it has tile lane in it. In Castellian, these tiles have colors and shapes on them, and you're trying to arrange them in a tableau in specific configurations so that they score you points. But there are scoring gates you have to pass through, so if you don't achieve a certain configuration first, you're just dead in the water right out of the gate. And then there is not enough room in your tableau to just create these configurations willy-nilly, so you have to plan ahead on how you can combine configurations to maximize on your score. There are negative tiles that are going to put the pressure on as you play. And really, Castellian is a very puzzly game that forces you to make a priority call every turn you take. And I love that about it. And that is why Castellian is my number 31 game. All right, that is the next episode in my top 50 board game series, Done and Dusted. I'm finding it's really hard to talk in a succinct way about all these games that I love because there's so many great things I can say about each of them. So thank you for bearing with me. We'll see you next time for number 30 through 21. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.